Welcome to Impact Farming, where we introduce you to the people and ideas that will have a massive impact on your farming operation. Brought to you by Farm Marketer. Sit down, start the engine, and let's roll with today's show. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Impact Farming Show. Today I'm so happy to have Dick Whitman joining us again. Hi Dick, how are you? I'm great. Good to see you again. Welcome back. We're happy to have you on the show. Today we're going to be talking about HR on the farm. So I know I have a good list of questions for you and I want to pick your brain. Before we dive in, can you tell our audience a little bit more about you and what you do? Well, I'm, my current role is board chair and transition coach for a 20,000 acre farm and ranch in Northern Idaho. Uh, I've also done family business and transition and financial consulting for the last 40 years. Uh, came back to the farm in 1980 after an eight-year stint in ag lending, and I've kind of been balancing the role of trying to apply farm management principles on a farm and then going out on the road and preaching the importance of these items. Perfect. Then I got the right guy to talk to today. (laughs) So I'm going to call a spade a spade right off the hop. I'm always a big fan of uh, saying it how it is or addressing the elephant in the room. Farmers like to farm business owners that build a business like to do what they are passionate about. So sometimes, as you know, as I know, as I've experienced, when we are building a business or building a farm, thinking about HR and processes like that might not be our most favorite thing to do. And especially as we grow our business, it's something we need to do. And maybe we push it off because of course, if somebody in our audience farms, they honestly love to be out with the animals or out in the crops, work in the field. So let's call a spade a spade right off the hop. But that's why it's important to take in ideas like this and talk to individuals like you who really preach this stuff and share the importance of bringing in some of these principles, procedures. So Can you touch, uh, that was a little bit long-winded, but can you touch on the importance of farm business management and HR principles? Sorry, Dick. If you look at the big picture of all the areas of management you want to be performing at a level of excellence, no farm business would disagree that we need to be excellent in production management, in farm machinery maintenance, um, agronomy, animal husbandry, if we're in the animal side of the business. And that's where we typically look at the metrics for success, you know, high yield, high quality, getting our farm work on a timely basis, having equipment up to date. But uh, that's why most people go into businesses to grow things. And In order to have a successful business, we need to put financial management, marketing performance, and human resource management on an equal plane as the production side, because if we don't handle those things in a level of excellence, it compromises everything else we do in a business, particularly in in the teamwork relationships, long-term succession of the business. And... I think as businesses have grown grown more complex and there are more people on board, there are actually people that like doing HR. There are people that like doing the animal side of the business. The challenge is in smaller operations where people are wearing all the hats, trying to be the jack of all trades or the jill of all trades, they tend to be skilled and, and quite proficient in the technical areas of the business but often struggle with the HR and the financial practices. So the question for them is, how do I get that level of excellence into my business? Do I outsource these services? Do I try to hire or train people internally to do these things well? And there is no one right answer, no silver bullet. 
the starting point is looking at what are the areas that we must be handling in a professional fashion to be getting a passing grade. Okay. So I, I, and I can always delve into the workings of a business and their processes and, and people that really are functioning at a level of excellence and professionalism in their, the way they, they handle their teamwork, their planning, their organization, their definition of roles and, and clarity of responsibilities, the extent to which they have clear policies in place and, and written documented SOPs, the extent to which they have really formalized and consistent performance review processes, both looking at the business financially and its trends, as well as looking at individual performance and, and doing evaluations on a regular basis. These are many of the proficiencies that go into a professionally managed business. And if you look at many farm businesses today, uh, most of that is handled really in, in an informal and often inconsistent manner. Mm, yes. Okay, I have a question for you. Uh, we're going to go a few different places this, uh, real quick with this interview. You have developed, uh, let's go there. That's a good way to set the stage. You have been doing consulting and teaching all of these practices for many years. You built your Building Effective Farm Management System manual that talks about everything and more that we're going to go into today. Culture, job descriptions, job contracts, wage reviews, planning, hiring, all that good stuff plus more. Here's my question. We have a lot of farmers that tune in to this show from across Canada, North America, around the world. If we are, let's say, mom and dad and one farm child, do we really need these processes or is this something that comes into place as you start to get more, uh, more employees or maybe even non-family employees? Can you touch on that? It's a great question, Tracy. And I get this all the time in a workshop where <clears throat> somebody comes up and says, this sounds all and good for a big, large, complicated business like yours, but why do I need that complication in my business? And the person asking that is often, a young man whose wife is standing there to decide maybe they have a two-year-old child and they're thinking life's simple. Why do I need org charts, job descriptions, written policies? I'll tell you a quick story. I had a young man at a young farmer workshop <clears throat> who asked me that question. And prior to asking the question, his wife had gone to use the restroom and I had asked him, what do you do? And he said, well, I'm in charge of agronomy and machinery maintenance. And uh, I make the decisions on when we, we do tillage and planting. And I said, what's your wife doing? He says, she handles all the finance, all the marketing. She's kind of my parts runner. And, and she came back out of the restroom and I said, so who is this young lady? He says, oh, that's just my wife. And, and I looked at him and I said, really, that's not how you just described her. You, you described her as kind of an equal partner conducting all these responsibilities and marketing, finance and so forth. He turned beet red and she was beaming. We don't realize that even on a two person team, we often have clearly defined roles and specialization where what was making their business successful is that they had already started to divide roles and that's collectively doing an excellent job of marketing, doing an excellent job of finance, putting alongside his excellence in the production side is what was making them succeed. And then I asked them, are you always going to be a business the same size as you are today and just the two of you? Or what happens when this young child here grows to be 17 or 18 and he's thinking about going to college? Or you'd come along with a daughter, he's wanting to know, how can I join a farm? This is an evolving process where you only put as much management sophistication in place as you need for your current affairs. But if you see your business as a long-term evolving business, you want to prepare to build your management system and your governance processes as your business grows. And the problem with many farm businesses is they grow the farm, they grow the agronomy, they grow the equipment line. They don't grow their darn financial functions as the business gets more sophisticated. And then they're in chaos. So now we're in triage trying to help them bring 
the same sophistication up to those processes that they already have in their agronomy and machinery function. So two lights turned on and I realized, oh, I need to build mine like you today, but 20 years from now, if I'm a larger business, I'm multiple employees, I need an org chart, I need job restrictions, I need written policies about how we're gonna handle compensation and what's the policy on who gets to come work in the business and not. So the, the secret in these things is thinking through the challenges you will face as a growing business and develop the structure as you grow and have it in place to support your evolution. Don't use it as a band-aid when you have a conflict or you have a fight over job descriptions or job roles, or you have a fight over policy and you go, I guess we need to sit down and work this out. And, and that's really what the guidebook is designed to do is th there is no one size fits all. Building a management system and government structure is not a fill in the box, plug and play. It's, I tell people consulting is an adaptive field. We're adapting managerial concepts to a business its state of growth at its stage of sophistication and its stage of complexity. And so you want as much complexity as you need, not too much and not too little. Okay. Fantastic. That's the best answer I've heard in a long time. <laughs> okay. So part of your binder, you talk about culture and how important that is. Do you want to dive into that a little bit? Well, culture is becoming an increasingly uh, popular term to describe what is, the, what is the atmosphere in a business. So if you look at um, businesses that have clearly defined the mission, their vision, their core values, um, you look at those terms collectively and they're not just touchy-feely statements that somebody's putting in a book and getting a foundation for how the people working together either align or don't on the expectations. If there's clear alignment on your vision of where you want to go, there's clear alignment on the mission of your business today. Why are we, what are we in business for? And you set some clear ground, ground rules of what are our core values that we will not deviate as a business. A lot of businesses will put that down on paper and then I'll ask them, <clears throat> are these core values something you're living up to or are these things that you're aspiring to live up to? And they'll often look at their floor and look at their shoes and go, well, we're probably aspiring, but we're not actually achieving these things. But how great would our culture be if we could say, yes, we're living up to all these things. So we, we're starting to use things like culture audits and businesses where we're asking a whole team, a series of que reflective questions where they're saying, how are we living up to our vision, to our, our core values? And when, if we say that we are not on a scale of one to five, we're not living up to these, what's causing us to go separate directions? And how is that contributing to conflict and impeding the teamwork in the business? And it's amazing how that conversation properly facilitated can really help people surface there's conflict, uh, areas of business uncertainty. Uh, maybe there's conflicts over growth, or maybe we're trying to be so efficient that we're undersized in terms of our staffing and it's creating unnecessary stress. So we don't do the culture audit just for the sake of doing it. We look at how can that affirm those areas that we're doing well and help identify areas that we need to really dig deeper on on working together as a team. Okay. Now I want to get really tangible and I'm thinking I did a lot of culture work um, kind of in the entrepreneurial world, scaling up all that concept. And I'm trying to bring this to a family farm where if there's outside employees, even more so important, but I'm thinking about a family farm, like what's culture, what's core values, work hard, play hard. Like I'm just trying to think of different ideas. We are, growing to expand to the next generation. We reinvest all our profits. I'm just trying to think of some of those ideas for alignment. I'll share, I'll share probably a half a dozen where I see the most okay. common conflict. 
So you have some in a business that are very open towards growth and innovation, and there's others that just don't want to change. They, let's keep the business the same size. Let's don't even think about a new product, or let's don't, let's, let's don't mess with our rotation. So yes. you don't want to have either extreme, but if you're stuck in concrete or you're always trying to change, that's yeah. probably not healthy. But the team has to have some alignment on what is, what is our collective attitude towards growth and innovation. And when you have, said, four or five people working in a business and four of them are all for one thing and one of them is just stuck in concrete, um, <clears throat> that may be not the only reason they're not compatible. But if you add that to other things, they may have to acknowledge, I'm just, I don't share the same expectations as others in the business and I need to get off the bus. Yeah. Some other areas where you often find huge uh, differences in culture is you have some that says, to be, be a successful business, we should interact in a professional fashion. We should talk professionally. We should try to understand personalities and, and look behind how do we, what do we do to maximize the quality of communication. And we would always look to be respectful to an outside vendor. Do we put that same standard on our interactions with family members? Whereas on the other extreme, you have people that saying, well, yeah, we should be respectful with people off the farm, but why do we have to do with that family? What, what are you going to do about it? And, and you watch people actually right, rationalize in their mind that it's, it's not only okay that nobody should take exception to them talking disrespectfully or unprofessionally. And when you ch call people out and say, would you do that if you were working for a business in town? And they go, oh, no, I'd be fired. And then they look at you like, oh, and then the person that's in a management role goes, yeah, I could fire you. So it's, it's moving away from the, the parental attitude where you tend to do things that you think you should get away with in a child-parent relationship, working towards a more business relationship. What are the business world expectations of how you should interact? Okay. So there's, that's a, a classic area where cultures can diverge. Another area that is, oftentimes a deal breaker is you have some people that feel like if I have the right last name, then I'm entitled to a job and I'm entitled to a paycheck regardless of my skill level or whatever. Whereas the other extreme is we believe in the school of merit that nobody should have a job unless they're properly skilled for it. They should have worked off the farm and had an apprenticeship to know who they are. And you earn your pay, you earn your promotions in the business and you're treated no different whether you're family or non-family when it comes to opportunities for decision making or pay. Whereas in the other extreme, you have people that say, I don't know. I don't agree with that. I want this business to have a place for every one of my people, my kids, my family. And that's my, my belief of why this business exists. Well, when you have those drastic differences in views, You've got school of merit versus entitlement. Uh, it's just like two different religions trying to live under the same roof in the church. It doesn't work. And so that's a split culture. It's a split philosophy where until you can have alignment in what the culture is and the policies that you're going to follow, um, it's just a recipe for a disaster. I love it. I'm glad I asked that because I've – often I'm more in the entrepreneurial space. When I was thinking of core values, I'm like, how do we bring that to the farm? But that last word that you said really just sums it up. It's alignment. So yeah. we don't have to get too woo woo on the terms for some people in the audience that are like core values. That sounds like fuzzy wuzzy because it might, I mean, maybe I even thought the same thing when I heard that, but it's not, it doesn't need to be fancy. It's just, we, as people that are working together, own a business together, we're aligned. And here's the key things that we want to be aligned on, right? Right. And I have what I call one of Whitman's laws, or some people call it Dickisms. <laughs> but it's a saying that says, in order for business transitions to succeed, there must be alignment of expectations. Yeah. Very simple statement. But I had a client a few years ago where 
I had no idea what to tell them because there was no future for them in a transition situation. It was just a wreck looking for a place to happen. And I finally, the only way that I could get the message to them was to get them to agree to that statement. That if your transition is going to succeed, there must be alignment of expectations. And they agreed to that. And then I said, I'm going to share with you 13 specific areas where you're not aligned in your expectations. And I said, if you agree with those, it would be suicidal as a business for you to even think about transitioning to the next generation. Mm-hmm. And I proceeded to lay out those 13 issues. They were not aligned on their mission, their vision. They were not aligned on core values. They were not aligned on respect for decision-making and roles that each party had in the business. They were not aligned on compensation. They were total un- unrealistic expectations that I should get it because I want it, yeah. whereas the parents are saying you should be paid based on your skill level. There was no alignment on the, the attitude of accountability. Um, the incoming generation had no tolerance for performance review and being held accountable. Just like, give me my money and let me take the farm over, but don't tell me what to do. And I'm cleaning up how bad this was. Ooh. <laughs> so when I got done, I said, are there any of these items that I've shared with you that I've overstated? Then they went, no. But the son and daughter-in-law still were saying, but we still think you should let us take the farm over. And when the parents looked at me and said, we think we got our answer and we think you're right, that we don't align on anything. And then the son and daughter-in-law basically said, if you don't let us take over the farm, you'll never see your grandkids again. Oh, So these, these parties were so extreme in unrealism of what it would take to have a successful business that it was easy for an outsider to come say that, but they were so emotionally attached to the idea that, a farm must transition to the next generation regardless, that they weren't looking at any of the metrics of success to make that happen successfully. Wow. Sorry, that's kind of a a downer of a story, but there's bits and pieces of that story that can apply to a lot of businesses. You know, that was a powerful story, and I like it because one of my main core values in life is freedom and knowing my direction in life. And I... uh, I don't like the puppet master game and the not knowing, nor am I entitled little brat (laughs) by any means. But I think that's very powerful because if there's no future, so often people just kind of shut their eyes and try and push through and make it happen. So sometimes the not so fun stories are just as powerful as the warm fuzzy stories, right? Yeah. And and the sad fact in this particular case is that the mother was the only realist in the group. She saw it for what it was. And she was the one that the son and daughter-in-law were constantly attacking. They tried everything in the world to attack her because they weren't on a realistic foundation of what they knew. And the dad was emotionally paralyzed by this. He was running, he was managing from his heart, which was saying, I'm only measuring my success on whether or not the business continues in the next generation. So it's like his only option in his mind is the farm has to go to the next generation. And so if it doesn't, then he felt like he'd fail. And I said, you, if you pass this business on and it goes upside down financially, and you also destroy your relationship with your kids and your grandkids, what have you accomplished? I said, you've got a $6 million net worth and a farm that every neighbor around you would lease in a heartbeat. You don't have to do this. Mm. we finally got to the reality is is if this is a predictable disaster, you'd be better off to lease this to neighbors and then leave the business or the assets to your children when you die. But why turn this over now and be living and watch them systematically dismantle it? And Mm. that was when his heart finally started listening to his head and said, I think you're right. As hard as that's going to be, that makes sense. You know, the farm and the family part, I think, trips us up a lot. Because if you looked at any business outside of family business, I shouldn't say just farm, a family business, there is none of this. It's black and white and dollars and cents and no emotion and respect uh, for the most part, right? But 
how many people in the audience watching, whether they're the founders or the next generation, can relate in one of those roles, right? The, the feeling, that pressure that the farm has to go on. There is a huge burden on farmers' yeah. shoulders, right? There is, and I want to mention a couple things. We, we spend a considerable amount of time in the guidebook helping people to realize that in a family farm business, you're obviously wearing three hats. You're wearing oftentimes an owner hat. You may be wearing a labor manager hat where you're working in the business, and you're also wearing a family hat. So for those members that are family or are working in the business and also owners, they have three different sets of dynamics that they're trying to manage all the time. Now, you, you mentioned this issue of how do we define success. And I think we've done a disservice to agriculture by implying that the only success event is that your business passes on. When the farmer tells me they feel like a total failure because they don't have a, a lineal heir wanting to continue in that profession, I just go right back in their face and say, let me ask you some questions. I said, well, did you get to pursue the career of your dreams? Oh yeah, I, I always wanted to farm and I was just elated every year that I got to do that. I said, did did your journey end up in you being financially successful and being in a position to retire with security? Oh yeah, I never dreamed the wealth I would accumulate in my career. I said, did your kids get to work in a rural community and learn your value systems and, and experience the value of rural living and maybe participate in 4-H or FFA and learn about leadership and public speaking that will help them no matter what career they went into? Oh man, my kids love 4-H, they love FFA. They, they really literally just grew in their ability to interact with people. I said, are, are you now at a point where your kids are doing what their dreams are, where your financial capacity and benefits can help them to achieve their dreams? Yes. I said, well, then celebrate. And they look at me like, what? And I said, celebrate. You have been a success. Amen. So the, the moral here is that when we always talk about mission and vision, and vision is where you want to be at the end of your career, we need to give people an expanded view of what success is. And one version of success may be to a position the business where someone could carry on if they so choose. But if there's nobody that wants to, we have alternate visions, which is we could exit the business and use our blessings to help our kids accomplish their dreams or maybe the kids don't want to work on the farm, but they're willing to, to own it as investors, where successful transition means training them to be a board of directors who will steward your assets and learn how to hire a manager to run the business if they don't actually want to work in the business. So we need to do a better job of, of coaching people of what happens at the exit point of your career, that there's not just one answer for success, there's multiple alternatives for defining success. Ooh, you were on fire. That is good. That is really good. There is a lot of pressure put on farmers and not right and can cause a lot of unhappiness. So that was a very good point. I'm glad that you shared that. You have some really good tools in the binder about job descriptions and I think job contracts and policies on who comes back to the farm. So I'm kind of doing a bit of, I think that's a nice grouping of topics right there. Would a farm founder, farm founders dare have a contract ready for their kid that comes back? That seems so, whew. what would you speak to that? Well, one of the principles that I'm really adamant about is that we should have policy before the need. So if you think about, let's say we're growing a business where our aspirations are to someday maybe have the next generation join us either as an owner or as an employee or both. We shouldn't just sit back and say, well, wait till they get on our doorstep and then answer the question. Do I even, do I even want you to work for us? Or are you even qualified to be an investor in my business? Um, these are probably two of the hottest topics in family business management as businesses have grown and become more complex is what is your family employment policy and what is your family business ownership or investment policy? So if you think about that, if you've sat down with your partners and said, 
what if somebody came to our door and said, what's the, what's the path for who gets to work in this business? What are the criteria? There's probably a dozen questions you should have already thought through. Should there be a vacancy? Do we require you to have an apprenticeship somewhere else? Do you have to have a skill set that matches a job opening? Or do we just say, if you're a family member, you get a job, regardless if you have the background? And there's, I won't go through all those, but they're all reasonable questions that a, a team should have the answers to so that when the, when the candidates come to your door, you don't change the answer depending on who's standing at the door. Mm. And we will all, we're human beings, it's easy to see someone go, no, you can't work here. Well, what's the criteria? Well, it's blah, 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 because you don't have a policy. And so what happens is you write the policy to fit the situation. And that's a massive opportunity for family conflict. And so in the guidebook, we spent a lot of time discussing what are the considerations? What are the questions you should ask? And then we have a sample policy that would be a starting point to say, well, here's what one could look like, but you don't have to agree with anything in here. But the issues that we address, you should respond to. So some people say, well, I don't believe in five-year apprenticeships, but I think it's a good idea if somebody works somewhere else for a couple of years. Great. Put your own personal thoughts into these. So none of this, these samples are designed to, to be an edict, but the whole concept in the guidebook is to give you working examples of how some of these things could be put in practice. It takes the mystery out of it. It takes the spinning your wheels for months and not having anything that makes any sense. And so whether it's having a sample policy to look at and edit and finally come to something that fits you, or let's say that you agree that you need written job descriptions so that people have a more clear understanding of what each person's role and responsibilities are. When I'm working with a client and if I ask them to write down their job duties, I'll often get two or three sentences. And let's say that person is the agronomy manager. And then I have them look at the sample agronomy manager description in the guidebook. And there's 25 different areas of decision making. And they read those and go, I didn't realize there are so many areas that I have to have expertise in. And so then it's, then it, we can have a conversation. That's, so if you're thinking about retiring in five years, how do you educate prospective candidates as to what the scope of your job is? What are the skill sets that you'd have to do to, to do everything from ordering seed to fertilizer to deciding when to spray, when to harvest, uh, how to do noxious weed control? And every one of these are unique, specific things where it's for somebody to step into that person's role they should have knowledge and experience to do it well. So you can't delegate what you can't define. So by being able to be specific of what your job is, skill sets, experience, you can, you can work in leadership transition by giving people a map of, okay, here's the things you need to learn. Here's areas where you need to be in an understudy role. And here's a timetable for when we can start turning over some of these duties to you one by one. And so it puts clarity into the transition process instead of just saying, I'm going to retire on August 31st and you can be the agronomy manager. And they're, they're thinking they know all about the job and they realize they don't have any clue what you do. Okay. So job descriptions and policies on who gets to come back and what qualifies them to come back. I love it. It provides a little bit of structure. And I guess I come from that corporate and career background. So I enjoy that. And you know what, when I started this media company, it was just me doing everything. And then you hire one person and you go, okay, whatever. All oh, right. You need more money this year, right? Let's just do, let's sit down and give you more money or whatever the case is. And then you get the next person and then you go, oh my gosh, I can't keep track of this. And oh my gosh, I need policies. It gets more complicated. And when you do have policies and stuff written and procedures for giving raises. It also takes out some of that personal sting, I find. Okay, well, sorry, your job is actually here, and this is the wage bracket. This is not yeah. a reflection on you, little Susie. This is a reflection of where you're at in this farm business. And when we, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, right. 
would you do a contract? If you were to hire one of your kids, would you do a formal contract? I don't know if it, it would be appropriate to do a contract, but okay. when somebody signs on to work in this business, they are, they're already pre, uh, oriented to what our, what our org chart looks like, what our job descriptions are for existing positions, what our policy structure is, and things like policies on work days and work hours and annual leave. How do we handle compensation? These are areas that are just glossed over many times in businesses where they people come to work and then they go, well, if I had any idea this is the way you operated, I would have never come back here. So part of your employment decision is that you inherently agree to follow the policies and procedures that the business mandates. So every employee that's hired has to review our safety policy and sign that they've, they've read it, they understand it, and they agree to follow it. And then annually, <clears throat> they sign a certificate that says, I've reviewed it, and I understand it, and I will follow it. Um, I don't know very many businesses that actually have someone sign an employment contract per se, because oftentimes the hiring decision is, we're hiring you to do this job. You hand them a job description on day one. You have an agreement on their compensation. You have an agreement on when their interim review will take place and when a, a performance evaluation, a formal one will be done. So all those bits and pieces collectively create the contractual relationship of what it means to come to work for this business. So I would say a contract would be more appropriate in the case of hiring an outside contractor where you're describing the scope of work, compensation, and so forth. Okay, that makes sense. You know, sometimes with this show, I'm a farmer and I get it and I see how fa family farms operate. We are farmers. And then you look at business world and you go, what practices and knowledge can we bring from the outside world, the regular business world into farming? And a lot of them you go, yeah, that's a good idea or part of that. And I just wondered, and I agree when you have your kid coming back, signing in a contract, I agree that that would be maybe a little too corporate, <laughs> but I was just curious on your thoughts on that. I, and I'm going to go, I'll take this one step further because my job is to ask those hard, weird questions and bring new ideas to our audience. What if you have to fire a family member? I mean, somebody you hire that's outside of the farm. Do you want to speak to that at all? Absolutely. And there are family businesses that are faced with that decision on a more frequent basis than we realize. And what makes it difficult is if there is no clarity of the job responsibilities, there's no uh, clarity on the policy for performance evaluation, there's no clarity on compensation, it's an opportunity for people that are not uh, either not competent or not choosing to be competent in their roles. It's really easy for them to exploit that. And so oftentimes it forces the business to put in place the mechanics that a well-run business should already have in place. And so if you have an employee that's simply not performing to par, you have a good evaluation system where they're warned, they're given an opportunity to correct. There's always, I had an old HR person 40 years that told me there's only three R's. You retrain redirect or you replace okay you think about this so sometimes we have the right person on the bus but not in the right seat okay. and that's as much the employer's fault as the employee but it's like i really like this person he or she has got skills but we don't have her doing the job where she can do the best thing for the business um maybe we have a person that could do this job better but we haven't given them the training to do this job well. And so maybe with some mutual effort on how to improve the training experience, we can bring them level. But then we have the third case where no amount of retraining, no amount of redirecting, they just don't have alignment with the business on key values. They don't have their idea of what's an acceptable work standard is not 
match ours. And so we have to define why it is that they're not acceptable hire and make the harsh decision to release them. And very rarely is a farm employee any different than an employee of any other business where they, they, HR laws talk about an at will employee. Um, you don't necessarily have to have cause a lot of times to say you're just not a fit here, but it is good to have a cause for dismissal. And the more you can document with things like a critical incident file, anecdotal situations where performance is unacceptable, prove that there was periodic feedback to let them know at the time that these things were in need of improvement. And then there's evidence that there was professional reviews where we, where we summed up blocks of time where the performance overall was not meeting expectations. That's just due process. And if you have those structures in place, when the day comes you have to dismiss, never going to be pleasant, but you've got your ducks in a row. And if somebody tries to come back on you, um, they're pretty hard pressed to say that you didn't follow fair practices. Okay. I'm glad you shared that. And the reason I'm bringing this up again and maybe move away from the farm child, but if we're hiring off farm labor, as I was growing this company, man, did I go through the ringer on HR. I will say I dislike HR. And it's not that I can't deal with conflict or any of it. It is just, yep. it's an interesting area of a business. When you are a business owner that wants to do the stuff you're really good at and grow the business, yep. I tend to find us individuals don't love that. So, yep. I'm probably bringing this to our audience because we don't often talk enough for those farms out there that are hiring people. And man, I was clueless. Like HR manual, policies, what, stats. I ended up having to hire a outsourced HR person to guide me along on a lot of this stuff because it's so tricky. You have people that come into your, and it applies to the farm. I mean, I had people that came into my company, pretended to work on their computer all day and shopped pretty much on Amazon all day. Then what? Who mm -hmm. wants to deal with this? And now let's flip to the farm world. You hire a farm laborer, you go out the, to the back acres there and you find them feet up in the tractor. A lot of the people in our audience, you're just not ready to deal with a lot of these stuff, a lot yeah. of these situations, right? Well, I, I totally feel your pain. And after 40 years of managing a business, our youngest daughter took over as CEO of the business. And she's, she was smarter than I when she, when she was two. I laugh. But, and she's also got a really strong background in HR. But I can't tell you how many times in the last three years we've had a conversation where she looked at me and said, do you want your job back? Amen. I mean, she's just going through the third degree with, with people issues. And that's just a fact of life. When you're in a business where you have to hire people, you do the best job you can, but it's, it's never perfect and it's never certainty. So you're having to make the hard calls on, on calling people out and, and putting them on probation or, or letting them go because they're not a good fit. I think one of the hardest things to have, you know, there's, if you, there's a saying, if you know what you don't know, you need training. If you don't know what you don't know, you need counseling. Mm. And we get employees that just don't know what they don't know. Yeah. So they have a false sense of their own competence. They have a, a false reality of how hard they're working or how productive they are. And, and sometimes you have to just get down and basic and say, it shouldn't take an hour to dig a post hole. We should be able to dig a post hole every 15 minutes and build fence here. And it's taking you an hour. It's just too long. At your hourly rate, I'm, I'm far better off to go contract this out to somebody else and let you go. So, Putting economic reality into how people's performance impacts the business is tough, but we have to do that. Um, maybe they lack a commitment to your safety policy and they're dangerous and they're careless and they break things and they destroy equipment. 
um, after so many documented situations, you just have to make the hard call and say, you're not a fit for us. So uh, I'm, I'm always impressed with an employee when we do a performance evaluation, they're more critical of themselves than I am of them as a supervisor. And I'm always more complimentary of their strengths than they are themselves. That's the kind of employee you want. And when, when somebody thinks that they're a better employer employee than you think they are, and you're sharing more concerns about their performance than they are, that tells me either you've done a poor job of communicating or they just have no reality in terms of what they contribute to a business. I found exactly that. Yeah, I love the ones. I messed up. I'm so sorry. And this is how I'm fixing it versus yeah. the 18 year old whippersnapper that wants my job <laughs> because yeah. they're smarter. Oh, good times. Okay. So I want to give a call out to your binder again. Reason being, when I was building my business, I couldn't find the business in a box. Had I had what you have built in your guidebook, I would have been so much further ahead. And I'm going to guarantee there's people in the audience that are in this position going, oh my gosh, I don't even, you, I search on the internet, I can't find stuff, it isn't right for agriculture. Can you talk about a few more things in your binder? And then we'll do one more question and work to wrap up. Okay. Well, I wrote this, the first edition was published in 2004. And the whole idea is to kind of provide you with like a John Deere manual of how do you build and document a formalized management system and governance structure. And first of all, people have to understand what does that mean? That's simply putting in writing things that often do exist in the business, but it's floating around in people's heads. If you ask five people, what's our mission, our vision, our core value, they'd all give you an answer. But in the absence of that being formally documented, you get five different answers. If you ask them, what are your jobs? Everybody would tell you their job, but if you had them write it down, there's totally different perceptions of what those are. So the whole idea of this guidebook is to help you take what's in your head and get it on paper so that there's more clarity amongst the team players on roles, on policies, and a commitment to a consistent process for evaluation processes. And the guidebook has 50 editable, downloadable files that give you beginning templates to put a lot of this in place. So you don't have to invent or create. You basically are starting with a template that gives you a starting point. You can streamline it, you can edit it. You'll think of policies that we don't have in the book, for example, and go, well, I need a policy on this topic as well. And the, the online version, it's $210 for the, the online, which gets you all the edible templates in the book. If you want the hard copy, it's another $40. And you look at that, and the total cost is less than one hour of hiring a consultant. Yes. I am a firm believer that farmers, many farmers are a do-it-yourself mentality, where if they buy into the importance of this, they're, they're open and willing to do as much of this as they can. So by, by downloading this guidebook and starting to work, it's not rocket science. It's just management 101 applied to a farm business. And so we take the mystique out of the terminology and, and help them to realize, oh, yeah, this does apply to my farm. And then you go as far as you can with, with self-medication. Then you reach a point where you go, if we're going to truly do this well, we probably need to hire a facilitator to keep us on task and get us through the tough issues. So let's say you go – the first round and everybody does their first round of job descriptions and there's alignment and agreement on 90%. But then there's 10% where everybody's in, they're just in limbo. There's a battle over, well, I thought that was my job. Well, I thought that was my job, or I think we should both get to do this and they can't resolve it. This is where a professional can come in and help walk through uh, middle ground where we get those obstacles out of the way so we can move on. There's 50 different topics on policy development that most of them fit a farm. Many of those, someone reads it and says, well, that, that's basically what we're doing now. We've just never written it down. So if that's the case, 
let's write it down, agree on it, and have a board meeting that says we're going to adopt these policies officially. Now all the employees know the rules. The employees' spouses also know the policies, so they're not in limbo of what's our compensation policy? You know, how many times do you know a spouse is calling the boss saying, what, what's your pay policy? Because the employee doesn't know, and they come home and they're complaining about the lack of clarity. Oftentimes, these policies are equally valuable for the extended family that doesn't work in the business, but they're very much impacted by the consistent policy structure in the business. Love it. So I'm kind of getting off in the weeds here, but my overall premise is that my long-term goal is anybody that aspires to want to be a professionally managed business has a clearly defined and documented management system and governance structure. And when we say, what is that? That is specific things. It's a written mission, vision, and core value statement. It's a clear organizational chart that says who's on our board, who is the manager, who are the people that manage subparts of the business, and to whom do they report clearly written job restrictions that we can use for training, for transition, for performing evaluations, clear policies, clear SOPs, and very transparent um, performance review processes like financial reviews, trend sheets, personnel performance evaluations, and so forth. And it's how do we do all these things? Who's in charge? That's really what the guidebook is designed to do, to help you put that into print. You know, I really like that. And I've experienced that as well as you start hiring people and no real structure. Can can I talk to you, Tracy? You know what that means. That means I want to talk about getting more money. <laughs> yeah. So you would have these conversations come up all the time and I pay well. But as soon as you have a procedure, it takes the personal, it takes a personal um factor out of it and you easily just say we review positions every January you know unless you apply for a new position and are promoted we talk about it at that time so thank you so really it lets you fall back on it and especially in family if you have a kid coming up to you all the time as maybe younger kids might want mom dad I need more money mom dad I need more money sorry sorry junior you know what, as a farm business, we talk about this every January. So unless there's something here that's come up, why don't we just talk about it there? Or keeping clarity between siblings. If you can fall back, see, I like it, it's structure, right? When you have structure and something to fall back on, there's a little bit of a blame that can go on to the procedures. It's not mom or it's not boss saying, it's, oh, as a farm business, these are our procedures and it's no longer mom or dad going, I'm sorry, I don't want to talk to you about money again. Right. And so, you know, oftentimes people say, well, we just need to take the emotion out of the business. Right. And I say, you, you can't take the emotion out of no, the business. No, but I try. <laughs> what you can do is you can build structure where you can manage those emotions. Yes. Or you don't want to have uncertainty in what your compensation policy is because that creates a lot of emotional backlash. Yes. But if there's a clearly written compensation policy and there's a timely uh, procedure for reviewing performance, for updating compensation like once a year, people may be emotionally um, unaccepting of your decisions, but at least there's a framework where they're their battle is against the process, not against you taking it out personally on them for no foundation reason. That is what I love about it. And as much as I did not enjoy those policies or creating them as I went, the structure provided <laughs> freedom. And especially to me in a farm business, if you have multiple siblings and parents and cousins working together, to me, if you can take out every single situation or have a fallback that prevents disagreement. It's one more chance to not harm those family relationships, right? Yep. Okay. And we don't want to look at any of these things as concrete. Uh, we had an interesting dynamic when I retired from the business and we now have a young generation, which is gen four and we have a fifth generation now working on the farm. And one of the issues as board chair is to 
make sure that the business is reviewing their policies. And we were getting, I was getting pushback at the next generation when you review these policies. Well, what it turned out was they were worried that I was going to lobby for keeping the same policies that we created 20 years ago. And I had to say, no, we built the policies that fit our generation, our value set. Uh, we had a work life balance metric that differs from yours. So yeah. I'm open to you changing the policy. What I won't permit is for you to not have a policy. You can't do it in limbo and say, I don't like it, but I'm, I'm not willing to change it. So I'll step back where I'll, I'll try to guide the calendar where you review and you change, or I won't be micromanaging what it says, but I want to make sure that you guys are updating those critical policies. And they have changed a lot of policies in their generation. They don't, they're not willing to work as many hours or days. Getting quality time with family is more important and in our era, we bought a business on 100% credit. We, we didn't have a choice. They, they have choices, and they're choosing more balance, which is a healthy thing. But then that has to reflect how do you change working hours in terms of expectation for a full year, how many hours, how many days. What if somebody wants to be a, a mom and wants to work three-fourths of the year? How do you modify policies so that we can accommodate people who will work overtime versus people that want to work less than 100%. And we have variable compensation that accommodates all those different roles. Wow. There, there's no, there's so many different variations now on who works in a business from full-time to part-time to contract work that we need a policy structure that supports all those variables. I love it. Okay, one final point. As we, we've we chatted about all these different procedures, the binders, and putting more business in the farm family business, can you maybe touch on the connection of having some structure and as families start to transition? Is there a correlation there? A huge correlation. And probably a fact that we should you know, put in a plug for Farm Management Canada. One of the reasons that we were able to update this guy and issue a whole new edition is that we worked in a partnership relationship with Farm Management Canada and several other sponsors to make this more robust, to make it more globally applicable. So it's, it's colorblind to country of origin. And so these management issues apply across the world. And while the guidebook focuses on management systems and processes, there's a direct parallel between the success in transition directly relating to the success to which you have put in place much of these professional structures. So one of the key questions that comes up in transition is, well, I want to look at where we're going to go. And I just back them up and say, I can't talk about how you can decide where you want to go and can tell you, until you can tell me where you are. Yes. Well, what do you mean? Well, I mean, describe for me today your org chart. Who is in your organization? What are their job responsibilities? What are the practices and policies you're following today? Because as you go to transition, you're going to have new people in new seats with new views on all these things. So people not only need clarity on how the practices are that exist today, but what leeway will they have to influence that in the future? So oftentimes, I see farm businesses that are very successful and very professionally run with none of this on paper. But it's husband-wife teams with a few key employees that work together for 40 years. And all the structure exists. It's just in everybody's heads. But when you bring new players into the picture, they don't know that. They can't read people's minds. And so the first act of transition is documenting on paper what's in people's minds. And even though they think there's a high degree of, of understanding communication, the act of putting it on paper goes, oh, my gosh, we don't have as much um, consensus as we thought. So it's not as easy as you think just to write down how we operate today, what our policies are today, what's our – job descriptions and so forth, that's a huge task. But once it's done, 
Now we know where the seats are, or who's sitting in what seats today, and we can say, who are the candidates to come into the business to take over these specific roles? What will be the ground rules of business in the future as people look to come into business? Who, family employment policy, we've talked about that. If you come back to the farm, it's often assumed that you will also get to be an owner. That's not a good assumption. Mm. You need to establish criteria for what is a good owner. And the family ownership policy has like 15 questions that you should address. Mm. You know, do you have to have a waiting period, work in the business so many years before you go to invest and make sure that that's a good idea? What about financial capacity? Um, if you buy into a 10% share of the business, are you understanding that you also have to make capital calls if it loses money? Do you have the resources to do that? Oh, I never thought about that. If you're going to sign loan documents where you're in a partnership, do you require total transparency where every partner shares their financial statements with each other? Somebody goes, oh, I'm not going to share all my stuff with you. Well, when we're partnership together, we're, in, we're signing off collectively for the debt to the business and we need to know all the liabilities that each of us has personally and how they impact that. So if somebody's not comfortable with that kind of transparency, then you have to reconsider and say, maybe you aren't set to, to be an investor. So how we define the ground rules of business for how we operate now is one challenge. How we move into transition Every single chapter has a direct parallel of how the issues in that chapter also affect a successful transition. As a matter of fact, we did a, a segment in the front of the book and the back of the book that said, how do each of the topics in each chapter support transition planning? And when people make that connection, it gives them a double motivation as to why these things need to be thought through and documented. Excellent. That is fantastic. I enjoyed everything you shared. And I think there's a lot of good information we haven't covered here on the show. And a lot of stuff that does, I don't see this getting covered in a lot of other media. So I'm really happy to have brought this HR focused conversation to our audience. I will give you, I, I know we need to wrap up here. I'll get you to do a call out. If anybody wants to connect with you by the binder, if you want to share any parting thoughts, here's your opportunity and then we'll wrap up. Well, I strongly recommend that people, if they're even intrigued with this discussion today, to go to the website and there's a number of free downloadable items. One of them is a farm management proficiency test or it's simply a series of, of practices that I call leading practices of successful farm businesses. And for each topic, the questions are, do I need this? Am I working on it? Or do I have this in place? If you take that test and then you decide that the ideal answer for every one of these is I should have been able to answer yes, most people taking this test will get a flunking grade. They will recognize the importance of many of these things, but they'll also recognize that I maybe learned how to do it in college or maybe I did it once in a workshop, but it's not a routine part of my business management process. So how do we, how do we decide how critical that is to my business? Is it, is the void or the, the shortcoming of not having it practiced enough that I need to make this a priority. And if you decide it is, take a look at the guidebook or take a look at going to some professional development courses where you can learn to implement many of those practices. Um, there's a synopsis of each chapter that kind of talks about what are the key issues that are addressed. If you read through those and you recognize yourself frequently, then you're probably a good candidate to say, I need to start working. I need to put my management system in the shop, just like I do the combine or the truck every year for an overhaul. Perfect. That is a great point to end at. If people want to buy the binder or connect with you, the website is WhitmanConsulting.com, right? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Okay, Dick, I know, speaking of board members, I know you have a board meeting to go to. I appreciate the time you've spent with myself and the audience. So thank you. 
And thank you in the audience. If you enjoyed this, like it, share it, get it out there, and other farmers can hear Dick's great wisdom. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you, Tracia. Always a pleasure. Keep, Thanks, Dick. Keep up the good work. Thanks, you too. Take care. You've been listening to Impact Farming. For more great episodes and articles designed to help you manage and grow your farming operation, head on over to farmmarketer.com. Don't forget to sign up while you're there. We will see you on the next episode.